Well, good morning, everyone. That's great. You turn the lights out. I can't see my notes. Um, <laughs> that's all right. I just want to have a quick this. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as Mike mentioned, uh, I did have the opportunity to chair the Michigan Climate Action Council and development of uh, Michigan Climate Plan. And uh, uh, I'm very pleased with the outcome. Uh, Center for Climate Strategies is uh, a virtual company that Tom Luby is a uh, member of, and he'll be talking uh, extensively about what they've been doing on behalf of a number of states. I think, Tom, now you've helped over 20 states develop plans. Uh, and as I recall, uh, and we're really quite proud of this, uh, CCS indicated that of all the state plans that you developed, there was a higher degree of collaboration here in Michigan than what you experienced elsewhere. And I think that's uh, a very significant statement uh, of the process here. All right, so we go this way. What I'd like to do is spend some time talking about Michigan's plan, uh, its uh, development, uh, the outcomes, and then uh, what I believe to be important next steps. But then I also want to talk a little bit, spend a little time on the New York Climate Project, uh, because I think there's an opportunity for us to learn from what's happening right now in New York, a process that's being facilitated by the Center for Climate Strategies, uh, and I'm participating in as well uh, on the adaptation component. First is a matter of background, and I'm going to have to move through these slides fairly quickly, but it might indicate there will be time for questions later. Just as background, uh, as we started the process in developing Michigan's climate plan, uh, we had to have some understanding of where we stood with respect to uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions in other states. And on this slide, I've identified where, you know, some of the important criteria that we considered as we move forward in development of the plan. Um, at the time we started the plan, uh, our 2005 emissions baseline was 248 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent, uh, projected to increase in a business as usual scenario up to 292 million tons of CO2. So we're looking at an increase over time. Uh, the, um, our greenhouse gas emissions were uh, rising, but at a rate slower than the national average, 12 to 16%, not a huge difference, but some difference. And most of that's probably reflective of the economy here in Michigan. Sector emissions here uh, in Michigan really mirror the national averages. About 36% of greenhouse gases in Michigan are uh, associated with uh, uh, electricity generation, about 24% transportation, and 24% uh, from residential, commercial, and industrial buildings. One thing that's a little different about Michigan, but it, it uh, suggests an opportunity, when you just look at Greenhouse gases associated with the residential component uh, of housing in the state of Michigan is actually lower than uh, most of the Midwest states. I think we're around 8%. Uh, most of the other Midwest states are around 10 or 11%. And what that suggests to me is that we have some opportunity in our residential housing stock to make improvement and in, in, uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the last uh, uh, couple of bullets uh, are fairly significant. Uh, about 90 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent uh, are associated with consumption of uh, electricity or, uh, in the state. And our in-state production, when you look at greenhouse gases associated with in-state production, we're at 71 million metric tons. This indicates that we are a net importer of energy, and I don't think that's probably very surprising to most folks. All right, Michigan Climate Action Council was created by executive order in 2007. It was meant to be advisory to the DEQ and to the executive branch. Uh, it was a rather large group, uh, 35 members. I would not say unwieldy, because I see a lot of members out here in the audience. Uh, but it was a large group, and we had the utilities represented, the autos, uh, unions, uh, the environmental conservation community, uh, and in my experience, when you can get all those groups to agree to something, that's really quite an accomplishment. And uh, as I will note later, we actually were able to do that on virtually all of our policy options. And then in addition to that, we created what are called, uh, we refer to them as TWIGs, Technical Work Groups. And uh, these uh, technical work groups, uh, anyone who had an interest could participate uh, in one of these groups. And these groups really were intended to assist the uh, deliberative process that the council was going through. And we had the good fortune of having over 104 individuals in the state of Michigan participate as part of those uh, toys. The charge was really quite straightforward. Uh, develop an inventory and forecast 
uh, on greenhouse gases, uh, compile a climate action plan with recommendations uh, that the state could implement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Michigan, and then advise local governments on climate change. This last uh, 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 charge or, or requirement is one that I think uh, there hasn't been a lot of follow through uh, as of today, but it is one that we need to follow through with local units of government to help them as they explore ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. As I mentioned, uh, we chose the Center for Climate Strategies to be our facilitator in this process. Uh, they are a virtual company. By that I mean they have a, an office in Washington, D.C., but they draw on the talents and skills of individuals across the nation. Uh, and Tom Luby, who was our facilitator, actually came here from Colorado. And Tom, we probably had CCS uh, members from D.C., Vermont, Colorado, various places nationwide to help us in the process. Uh, and they have a lot of experience. They've now helped over 20 states develop plans. And what they do is they break, uh, um, they, uh, break down into components, into sectors. And we had, uh, in our particular process, six sectors that are identified on this slide. We had one for energy supply, uh, residential, commercial, industrial uh, buildings, transportation, land use, ag, forestry, and waste, uh, cross-cutting, which is where you put everything that doesn't fit someplace else, uh, and then we, uh, as we were engaged in the process, uh, we decided we needed to create a separate uh, technical work group and sector to address market-based policies, which really was uh, the consideration of the cap and trade program. Well, in March of 2009, after deliberating for about 18 months, we finalized our report and plan for the state of Michigan. We started out with a catalog of about 300 policy options and recommendations. Uh, the council and the uh, twigs added another 50 or so uh, recommendations. We then took that 330, 350 plus uh, policy recommendations and winnowed it down to 54 policy recommendations that made the uh, final report. Of those 54, 33 were quantifiable. Uh, by that I mean we could actually, uh, CCS could actually calculate or project the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that could be reduced if we implemented those policies. With respect to the remaining uh, policies, they were really more uh, uh, statements of commitment on the part of the, part of the uh, state of Michigan. We set uh, greenhouse gas reduction goals for ourselves, so made recommendation to the state of Michigan that those goals be set consistent with the Midwest Governors Association um, uh, goals. So we decided on uh, one mid-year uh, uh, um, reduction goal of 20% by 2020, and we used 2005 as the base year rather than 1990. If, you, if you're familiar with uh, state action plans, you'll see that a number of states have chosen 1990's base year uh, because they feel more comfortable with the data they have for that year. We didn't. We didn't feel we had uh, really solid data for going back as far as 1990, and so we used really the best data set we had, which was 2005. And then, of course, we set an aspirational goal, which is really quite common. Uh, and you'll see it later when we talk about New York, 8% below 2005 level by 2050. And based on calculations that uh, uh, CCS did at the time, if we actually implemented those 33 quantifiable uh, policy options, that would uh, we could see a savings of $10 billion between now uh, and uh, 2025. We could reduce greenhouse gases by a total of 987 million metric tons about 41 million metric tons in 2015 on an annual basis, and 117 million metric tons on an annual basis by 2025, pretty significant. And really, the policies are, are meant to be transformative, uh, transformative uh, in our transportation, energy, and manufacturing sectors. This is the uh, famous uh, alligator jaws uh, slide. Uh, Tom's probably got one in his presentation as well. Uh, really the significant, this is, this is specific to the Michigan plan, and the reason it's important is that it shows if in fact we implement the 33 quantifiable policy options and they achieve the greenhouse gas emissions that uh, were projected, Michigan can in fact meet a 20% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2020 with over 7 million metric tons of uh, greenhouse gas reductions to spare. So it is possible. It is clearly within the realm of possible for us to do this, at least not for the 2020. 
Then uh, uh, just quickly, uh, a couple more slides that show the uh, greenhouse gas reduction potential. Here it's shown by uh, policy uh, initiative, not surprising. Uh, the uh, orange bars there reflect uh, reductions uh, that can be realized through energy efficiency in building stock. Uh, and so you'll see a lot of energy, uh, excuse me, a lot of greenhouse gas reduction associated with uh, uh, creating new building codes, more restricted building codes, and energy with uh, tougher energy efficiency requirements, uh, retrofitting uh, existing buildings to achieve greater uh, energy efficiency, and then also creating economic incentives to reduce uh, or to um, create incentives for reducing energy usage in buildings. And uh, they really kind of dominate uh, the early on reductions as part of the process. This just uh, uh, identifies some of those options. As I was saying, uh, a number of the uh, savings can be realized and greenhouse gas reductions can be realized in, uh, in our building stock. Um, also, you'll see that uh, in, we realize significant reductions in greenhouse gases as we move to more uh, and greater use of renewables, uh, which by our definition includes biomass, it did include nuclear, uh, geothermal, thermal, photovoltaic, and so forth. You know, a word on uh, the policy options. So the 54 policy options, I think technically there were two that we didn't get uh, unanimity on, and one was nuclear. Uh, and it was an interesting uh, uh, discussion that lasted for probably, uh, Scott, I'd say over an hour. We, we talked about an hour on nuclear. And uh, I, I believe I'm reflecting the, the perspective of the environmental community correctly here. It wasn't that uh, the environmental community was objecting to and insisting that nuclear power be removed from consideration, but rather they didn't want nuclear power being considered as an option until the storage issue had been resolved along the Great Lakes. Uh, but we spent about an hour debating it and eventually decided, uh, based on the majority vote, to keep it in. Uh, and I think you'll see in any, quite honestly, any serious uh, discussion about meeting uh, these very aggressive greenhouse gas reduction goals, you'll see nuclear power is, is uh, one of the options that is Then from a cost savings perspective, uh, what are the options that make sense? I mean, we're, what, what can we do now? What are the low hanging fruit that we could uh, implement at uh, a cost savings uh, and, and still get some greenhouse gas reduction? Albeit not as great as, uh, as perhaps use of renewable uh, energy, but nonetheless achieve some, uh, some reductions. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, better, smarter land use planning uh, can net uh, some uh, can be done in a cost savings manner. Uh, eco driver programs uh, could be developed. We're doing that at the state level. I'm not quite sure what the status is, but the uh, Department of Management and Budget is in the process of developing a plan for the state of Michigan. And that uh, th this is really just providing information to drivers on how best to achieve greater fuel efficiency and thereby reduce greenhouse gas emissions associated with transportation. Uh, truck idling policies, again, these are very cost effective measures that can be implemented. Uh, fairly quickly by uh, by uh, the state. All right, so uh, came out with a plan in March 2009. There were 54 policy recommendations. The good news is we started to implement some of those. In July of last year, the governor issued an executive directive that in, uh, requires the state to begin to implement some of the policy options. First and foremost, the governor adopted the greenhouse gas goals uh, for the executive branch of government. Uh, then uh, the governor um, mandated that the macroeconomic analysis be done on um, policy options. We had looked at the costs uh, associated with implementing those measures, but we really hadn't assessed what the impact of implementing those policy options would be on jobs, uh, jobs growth in the state of Michigan and the state's economy. And that's really the focus of macroeconomic analysis. And then we did accelerate action on uh, building codes I'm told that uh, the Department of Energy, Labor, Economic Growth is in the process of uh, uh, moving forward some more restrictive uh, uh, energy efficiency requirements for new buildings as we speak. And a couple other uh, items I identified as well. Good news is we were able to convince the Kresge Foundation to provide $75,000 for the ma uh, macroeconomic analysis. Uh, that money uh, was provided to, the, to uh, CCS 
provide assistance to the state in conducting this analysis. They reached out to Michigan State University, Steve Miller, an economist here, and then University of uh, Southern Cal, Adam Rose, I believe, was the economist there, to do the work. They did the work, and the results are really quite positive and perhaps counterintuitive to what people uh, really uh, want to believe. Bottom line is, based on their use of the accepted model, uh, model techniques, they determined that if the uh, policy recommendations are implemented, uh, that, could, that could, for the state of Michigan, mean 129,000 net jobs between 2010 and 2025, and an increase of 25, over $25 billion to our state uh, gross uh, product. So what's left? Uh, well, we still need to prioritize the remaining policy options. The governor's directive really just begins the process of implementing some of the, uh, uh, as I said, low-hanging fruit. Uh, but there are many other options that we need as a state to decide uh, how do we want to prioritize these, when do we want to begin to implement these particular recommendations and options. Some will require legislation. They cannot all be accomplished through executive action. So, there will have to be some kind of plan development for implementing the measures. The next area we need to move into, and it's an area that um, I want to talk more about when I talk about New York, is adaptation. The plan that we developed is really focused on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But the fact of the matter is change has already occurred. So what do we do in response to that change? How do we minimize adverse impacts? How do we frankly uh, take advantage of what some of the benefits might be? And when I say that, I think in particular of agriculture. Uh, growing seasons have changed. The ability to grow certain crops uh, further north uh, it, uh, is a reality now. There may be some opportunities as well as costs associated with what's likely to occur because of climate change. Let me talk a bit about New York's climate project because I think it is very instructive. Uh, they already have a mitigation plan. They wanted to update that plan. And they wanted to take a real hard look at what's it going to take for New York to get an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Uh, they created a Climate Action Council. They're supposed to have a climate plan done before uh, Governor Patterson is out of office. So he has set a uh, date. Uh, he's actually just modified this. He's now giving them, graciously given the group until November 1st uh, to get his work done. So he's given, given them uh, an additional 30 days. And, uh, but importantly, this plan development includes an element that was not part of Michigan's plan and really hasn't been a part of many plans at all. And that's the uh, inquiry as to how do we adapt to the changes that are already occurring in New York. Not surprisingly, they created a number of technical work groups. Uh, by the way, the Center for Climate Strategies is assisting this process. So on the mitigation side, uh, the process is very similar to what Michigan went through. The one exception is adaptation. They uh, established a technical work group to look at adaptation, and uh, I have the, the good fortune of uh, chairing that particular group. So what does the adaptation technical work group need to do? Well, in New York, and I'm going to talk about it in a minute, there's a group called Climb Aid, or there's an initiative referred to as Climb Aid, that's actually been doing some pretty serious adaptation uh, research for about 18 months now. Uh, in addition to that, New York um, has been very engaged on the issue of adaptation. The city of New York in particular, uh, there's a real concern on the East Coast about sea levels uh, and sea level rise and its impact on infrastructure. So there's a fair amount of work that's already been done. And so the adaptation technical work group is supposed to take all of this work, kind of uh, digest it, uh, analyze it, and then come up with policy recommendations that they would uh, put forward uh, and make uh, uh, recommendations to the Climate Action Council. As I mentioned, there is this initiative in New York referred to as Climate Aid. It, uh, a couple of years ago, the uh, New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, NYSERDA, we don't have anything quite like that in the state of Michigan. It's kind of a policy-oriented uh, energy uh, uh, government uh, body. They uh, put out a bid request uh, looking for uh, an institution or an organization that would do some uh, vulnerability assessments uh, on behalf of the state of New York and make some recommendations with respect to kind of overarching adaptation strategies that New York could uh, implement to not only 
minimize, as I said, the uh, 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 damage that would likely occur from something like sea level rise, but also to take advantage of opportunities, in particular in New York, uh, when it comes to, to agriculture and its impact on uh, crops in uh, uh, crop development in New York. The group that uh, eventually got the uh, received the bid was a group of researchers from three universities, Cornell, Columbia, and uh, actually it's, uh, City University of New York is the third uh, participant in that group. And they've been looking at this issue for uh, about 18 months now. And what they've been trying to do is identify and characterize what the vulnerabilities are in New York, what's it mean for infrastructure, what do we need to do to harden that infrastructure. Uh, they're trying to prioritize those vulnerabilities and then uh, review and consider adaptation strategies responsive to those vulnerabilities. They are looking at it uh, from a sector-based approach. They've broken into groups, uh, not surprising here, agriculture, coastal zones, communications, ecosystems, Energy, public health is an important consideration when you're looking at adaptation, transportation, and water resources. And they're literally developing uh, fairly lengthy chapters for each one of these sectors on what the vulnerabilities are and what uh, some possible adaptation strategies could be. The adaptation technical work group that I chair decided that it made sense for us to kind of break into subgroups along the same themes, the same sector themes. So we've done that. We're going to analyze all this data. We're in the process of doing that right now, uh, analyzing this data, and hopefully within the next couple of months, we will come up with very specific policy recommendations that will be put in or placed in templates, uh, and then uh, we will we will prioritize those recommendations, and then take the highest priority recommendations back to the New York Climate Action Council for action. And then the last slide I want to leave you with is um, New York did one other very interesting thing. They decided to go through a visioning exercise. They, they, they were, you know, they had a, a, a mid-year kind of, or mid-century, uh, maybe mid-year, near-term uh, goal of about 20% by 2020. And, you know, they're well on their way to, to meeting that. But they wanted to determine what's it going to take us to get to 80% reduction by 2050. And they came up with three scenarios, the yellow scenario, the deep blue scenario, and the ultraviolet scenario. And uh, they uh, then made some um, very significant assumptions. They assumed that they would get, uh, they would maximize energy efficiency in buildings. They would uh, electrify everything. By that I mean they would, uh, buildings would, uh, would move off of natural gas and onto electricity. <coughs> Transportation would be electrified through, uh, through plug-in uh, vehicles. Uh, they also assumed that they would totally wean themselves from fossil fuels in transportation, that they would go to some uh, biofuels, or it would be totally electrified otherwise. Uh, and uh, then, if in fact there were any use of fossil fuels like natural gas, that that would include carbon storage and sequestration, carbon capture and sequestration, even though the technology to do that doesn't presently exist. And even with those assumptions, uh, they, under the yellow scenario, could not get to 80%. They could only get to about 56% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So they took it a step further in the deep blue and the ultraviolet, and you can see in both scenarios uh, uh, some significant changes. They went, uh, uh, they started to uh, look more and more towards the use of nuclear, and in the ultraviolet scenario, you'll see a 35% increase in nuclear, uh, which would be 10 to 12 new plants. And then in the deep blue, they went to two new plants. And then in addition to that, uh, under the deep blue scenario, they went uh, completely with the uh, light green vehicles, completely with hydrogen, 100% hydrogen, which I'm told, and maybe Skiles, you can elaborate on this, again, would take smaller nuclear reactors to produce that hydrogen. So uh, they made some pretty dramatic assumptions to get them to that 8% reduction. But those other two scenarios didn't get there. And if you're interested in this uh, visioning uh, exercise, you can go to nyclimatechange.us and visioning paper is available there. And you know, I, I offer this not because it's, it can be rather sobering, but rather to uh, underscore that this is a real challenge. When you start looking out to 2050, 
uh, and you're looking at an 8% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Obviously, that's going to take some fairly dramatic uh, steps, and it's going to require uh, changes in lifestyles uh, and approaches. And frankly, it's going to take uh, development of technologies that today simply don't exist. Uh, and so it's a very, very, very much a challenge. It's one that we need to move forward on, but it is going to be something that uh, is really going to test our metal. So that might be our last slide. Thank you very much.